Hello, and welcome to another episode of Our Earth Brain. My name is Christina. Thank you for joining me. I'd like to start this episode with again apologizing. Apologizing for two things. One, for using the two languages of your oppressor. So I'm using English and Punj the, the Punjab, the Sikhs have been oppressed by the British for hundreds of years. And secondly, Hindi, because the Indian government still to this day is oppressive of, of the Sikhs and uh, the Khalsa. So I apologize for that. And I also want to apologize for any mistakes that I make in relaying information through this media, through through my um, Our Earth Brain television episodes, because I'm a babe in this Sikhi. I am just new at, at understanding what this is about. I'm researching as much as I can. I'm asking for people to contribute to my knowledge and to correct me where, where it's important to do so, because I, I'm new to this. I As I've, I've revealed in past episodes, I lived in India for the bulk of 11 years, but I never actually went to Punjab. I've never been there. And I very much understand why now I never made it to Punjab. You know, so many people would say to me, you have to go to Amritsar, you have to see the Golden Temple. And I don't know why it, it wasn't a, a huge priority for me, but I also know that I've lived my life in a way where I try to allow the energies that inform my being, guide my being. And I wasn't guided to go to Punjab, and I understand why. Because I would have gone as an ignorant tourist. I would have gone without a proper understanding of what, what it is to be Sikh, what Sikhi is, and I, I wouldn't have given it the proper veneration that it absolutely deserves. And I'm so, so grateful that at this point in my life that I have discovered Sikhi, that I have discovered who the Sikhs are, what you're here for, what you represent, and the message that stands behind all of it, which began with Baba Nanak Dev Ji Maharaj and his vision, Ek Onkar, and all of the subsequent gurus who carried forth this profound truth that will liberate humans from the suffering that our human consciousness experiences here in the material world, this truth will actually come to fruition in the understanding of hu the human mind. We will bring it forth because all of the stories are interwoven. And this is the part of the Sikhs. It's your job. Your gurus inform your consciousness and this is the message that is to be brought forth to your human brothers and sisters, that we are all one human family here. And in fact, it's actually a simple truth, isn't it? We, we can't deny it. We are all born on this planet, born with the bounty that this planet has given us for our existence. But we are living in a way that is so separate and isolating, it's not natural. This is not the way we were meant to live. We were meant to live in community and some cultures still live with a sense of community, living in joint family, Hindustan, for example, Bharat, India. Many, many of the, the tradition is still there. Much of that tradition is still there, living in joint family, which is a beautiful way to live, in fact. And it's actually been said, there's research that has been done to prove this, that it is toxic to raise a child in a single family dwelling, in a nuclear family with a mother and father and no one else. Because it's, first of all, it is so, so difficult to raise a child and to be on all the time, to have your consciousness there and ready for your child all the time. I can't even imagine being a single parent but let alone a mother and father trying their best to bring up their children in a moralistic way in this world, in this culture. It's very, very toxic 
for humans, human children to only see one male and one female as representative of what it means to be human. Whereas if you live in joint family, you get many, many images of that. And also too, there, there isn't such a sense of fear when you live in, in joint family and you live in a culture that experiences life in that way where you're sharing life. And having lived in India, I experienced this where children are passed, the babies go from the neighbor to the neighbor and everyone has a hand in, like we say, it takes a village to raise a child. In India, this is, this is palpably true. You can actually see it and experience it. And it's really a beautiful way to live because these children have many, many people that they can look to to understand, well, I don't have to be just this way, just the way my mother is, or just the way my father is. I can be like my chacha or my, my mosi, or we can, we can have other examples of how to live. And I've said that, I've touched on that in a previous episode, um, but I want to explain here why you will hear so much repetition in the message that I am speaking. It's because human brain, the human brain, humans generally need to hear something nine times before they're able to fully integrate it into their consciousness to be able to live from that as a foundational truth. So nine times of repeating something for our brain to really take it in and it becomes part of how we live. So you will hear, you will hear me repeating things. You'll hear that the same message coming again and again, like the stories are all interwoven. This is such an important point because they are. And the reason why I'm saying it over and over again here is because I want the six to understand their part in the global story. And your part as a Sikh is to bring forth Baba Nanak Dev Ji Maharaja's truth, his truth of Ikonkar. You know it. Our human brothers and sisters have forgotten this truth, or some understand it, but globally en masse, we need to come together and create this as an observ observable truth, instead of it just being um, it, just a concept or a theology, because it in fact is the truth. Science now proves it. This is so simple for us to understand and how the stories are all interwoven is that Baba Nanak Dev Ji started it. It was continued with all of the gurus until we came to the 10th guru who realized the importance of fighting for this truth, standing for this truth. It doesn't need to be done with violence. It needs to be done with conviction and with righteousness. And this is something the Sikhs have. Merasi Kompariwar, this is who you are. This is who is, who shines forth. This is who I see when I see the six with their symbols, wearing kara, wearing dastara, having karpan. This is who you are. This is why those symbols are so important because our human family, we are starving for the truth and we are begging for the leaders to come forward on this planet. We're waiting for you. We're waiting. We really need you to come forth. We need all of these faction groups. There are so many incredible groups here, Sikh groups, but they're working individualistically. But there's one thing that you all have in common, and that is Sikhi. This is the truth that you will help to bring forward. It's time to let go of all of the differences it doesn't matter which Gurudwara you go to. It doesn't matter how or what rules you think you live by or that others should live by. You all know Sikhi. You all know the power of Simran. You all know that Waheguru is here to guide us. That this is what intelligent design was made for. And part of that intelligent design is this story. It's this collective human story of everything that's happened, all of the atrocities, all of the injustice, the discrimination, all of the isms, the racism, the sexism, the lookism, everything that has existed here has had to happen in order for us to actually look at it and break it apart, recognizing this is not the way we want to live. 
we are not meant to live with that kind of injustice and that kind of torture for our consciousness or our human spirit. That's not how we're meant to live. We are meant to live in community. We are meant to celebrate this joyous existence, being in physical form, joyously sharing the bounty of our life with the people who are close to us. This is what it's meant to be. So you'll hear this repetition. You'll hear me repeat the same message again and again. These stories are interwoven. And in fact, if I'm not mistaken, I've heard it said that ik onkar, one of the most powerful mantras to ever exist. In fact, it's probably the mantra, the ultimate mantra, because everything is of creation. We are all of the one source of creation. This powerful mantra, if I'm not mistaken, it's repeated in the Guru Granth Sahib Ji 537 times. And this is why, because we need as humans to hear this same powerful message again and again and again, until we feel it in ourselves, until it becomes part of our every breath, ikonkar, recognizing that the creator is in you, as is in me, as every other living being here. And in fact, as is in the Maya itself as well, because we couldn't exist without this Maya, without this concept of duality. We couldn't understand the bliss without understanding the sadness that has existed. And this is what it means. These stories are all interwoven so we can look at them all, take them apart, tell the truth about them, tell the truth about what's happened, tell the truth about the genocide, tell the truth about all of the discrimination, all of the injustice. It's a matter of actually speaking to it. Instead of burying our head in the sand with this cognitive dissonance, we know it's there. We feel it in our heart. We feel the sadness of these things that have happened here, but we can't talk about it. We have to talk about it in order to heal it. We have to come forward with these truths. Speak the truth so we can grieve it. We can let go of the sadness that we've boxed. That's so unhealthy, it's so toxic. And we've done this, like, it's important to understand, women have a tiny bit of, um, a little bit more of a bounty in being female, insofar as it's sort of okay for a woman to cry. Now, we have taught, and I think women, because we're the ones who raise children predominantly, we have taught the boys in our culture that it is wrong to cry or that you are somehow weak if you're crying. But I'm gonna tell you, crying is a way that we release the pain. We release the stored up anguish that we feel inside because we are not meant to be living this isolated way. And that creates such a, a torment for our physical being, for our consciousness, for our soul, for our, our physical being. And so crying is a way to actually release that, to release the tension that is being built all the time. And if that tension doesn't get released with tears, it very often gets released with anger. And we've taught our boys, it's okay to be angry. Like it's okay to transform the sadness into anger. That's not right. Anger hurts people. Anger hurts us. Anger disrupts our brain waves. Our brain waves are not functioning in harmony when we're angry. When we're angry, our brain waves look all, all distorted. Whereas when we're in harmony, our brain waves have a pattern to them. And they're very beautiful, actually. Um, yeah. Okay. Now, these stories that are all interwoven, I want again to speak to the story that for me really radicalized me in this. Now, I have been an activist since I was knee high to a grasshopper, since I was a tiny child. One of the very first questions I asked as probably a three-year-old was, who created God? And if I had been born in Sikhi, if I had been born a Sikh, someone would have said to, well, I would have probably already understood it because of my mantra all of the attributes of God are there. I would have understood that there is no time, there is no space, everything is of the creator. However, these stories that all 
are interwoven. For me, how it really came to be was how I discovered Sant G. And that's, it happened actually only about four or five months ago. And I, I'll tell the story now. I told it when I was interviewed by uh, my, my brother Mandipji on Virsat. Um, I was at a, a mela. I was at Nagar Kirtan at the Malton Gurudwara here in Brampton. And I marched with everybody and it was beautiful. All the people lining the streets, there were thousands of people there. And when, when we converged on the Malton Gurudwara, there were stalls everywhere and it reminded me so much of India. I felt like I was back at home in India because everybody was packed together. It was shoulder to shoulder and you had to kind of push through and you had to hold your, your friend's jacket if you were going to go somewhere because you didn't want to lose people because everybody was packed in there, thousands of people. And of course I was happy happy because it reminded me of my India, um, which I love, my, my home is there. And very interestingly, and this is how I know that there is intelligent design and that these stories are interwoven. I was standing at a food stall with a friend and turned and all of a sudden amongst these thousands of people, these, this huge group of people, it was like the seas parted and there was a giant opening for about 300 meters and I could see across the way there was a man wearing a t-shirt and on this t-shirt I thought I saw from this distance of about 300 meters away, I thought I saw the image of Che Guevara, who is another revolutionary, who is also a hero of mine, wholeheartedly. So of course I was excited and I thought to myself, Che Guevara at a Sikh festival? I didn't understand. So, and something triggered in me in that moment, something, something came alive. So I ran to this man wearing this t-shirt and I asked him, wow, what is this? And when I looked and I saw this image and it was a picture of Shahid Sant Jarnal Bhindrawali Khalsaji. Um, and he, and beside it, his image that was black on a white t-shirt were the words warrior saints. Now that definitely intrigued me because at that point I knew nothing, nothing about Sikhi. I was understanding a little bit about Baba Nanak Dev Ji's truth, but I knew nothing about Sant Safai. I knew nothing about the saint and the soldier, and how important it is to have both of these as your foundation in Sikhi, because one without the other is dangerous. If you are a saint without being a soldier, you're not bringing forth the truth on this planet. And sure, you can sit in meditation and, and bring forth some of that energy, but until we come together as one human family and we stand with our physical being for this truth, it will not change. Power does not concede without force. And that force doesn't have to be violent, but it has to be unified. And that's where the six come in, because you know this is your dharam. You know this is who you are. And you know that living in these factions, in these separate groups, not coming together, that's not the message of Sikhi. That is not what is meant to be happening here. We are meant to let go of all of this judgment to come together as the warriors for truth, the warriors for peace. And I stand with you. Every cell of my being is here with conviction to stand with you as your sister in this cause. And I am grateful and I am comforted to know that you are here and that you carry, you wear the symbols. So the rest of my human family the rest of our human family, my white brothers and sisters, can look to you. They can see who you are. And no one can mask with these symbols and get away with it. Because the symbols are just one thing. But what comes is that righteousness. And that's what shines from you. Anyone can put on a turban. Anyone can wear kara. But what comes from you is this righteousness. That is what I see. That even without a turban, even without kirpan, I see and I recognize. That is who you are and that's what we can look to. And I am here to help educate my white brothers and sisters in this so they can understand it 
and they can also look to you with confidence. And I'm here to call forth you. Merci compariwar. I'm here to call you out and for you to acknowledge this truth. I'm here to help you acknowledge this truth so you can step out of any of the things that are constraining you from joining in one human voice, for joining your powerful intention, your mind's creative energy, giving your mind, as it says in Siki, giving your head to this cause, giving your mind's creative power, which is your voice, which is your physical energy, giving it to this cause. It doesn't have to be violent. We don't want violence. We've had enough violence. There has been enough, enough violence on this planet. It's time to dissect that, to take violence out of the language. There's almost no way to describe you without using violent language. You know, we say warrior. Well, the word war is in warrior. Even if you look at it in different languages, you look at it in French, it's the same thing, guerre. The word war is built into guerre, the warrior. There's, and this is, <laughs> fundamentally this comes from the birth of the military. And this all happened with the birth of agriculture. That was the birth of exploitation. It was the birth of slavery. It was the birth of the military and police force because now you have to guard the grain that's being, that's being um, stored. And very interestingly, most likely, now I wasn't there, but from the research I've done and from what I understand, it was also the birthplace of addiction. And we are all addicted to carbohydrates for the most part. And we don't need to be eating as much as we do but we are eating so much, I think, just to stifle this feeling of separateness and not being able to live as one human community and do what is best for everyone here. And if we were doing that, we would be living with so much joy, we wouldn't need to be stuffing our faces. We wouldn't need to be numbing with alcohol or drugs because living in a state of cooperation working together produces a high that far exceeds any high you can, any nasha you can get from a substance. And we know this, and I've said this before, and again, we need to hear it again and again. When you work for seva, when you're working in the Lunger Hall or, or any place and you're doing seva and you're working with a group of people, there's a sense of camaraderie, that energy that is produced, it enlivens your cells. Your brain functions in a better way. You're, you feel alive, you feel happy, you want to keep contributing, you hardly get tired, you almost don't feel the exhaustion of your body, you can work for hours and hours, because that's how we're meant to be. We are meant to be living in that sense of like a colony where we're doing what is best for everyone here. That's part of our story as humans here. And then we have to ask ourselves, really, this is the question, what story do we want to live by? Do we want to live by a story where corporate interests are dictating how we will live? Corporate interests? Or do we want to live free in our chosen community? Freedom. Freedom is our birthright. We were meant to live free. And I want to talk a little bit now about this word freedom. And specifically, when I first started looking into Sikhi and understanding this concept of Miri and Piri, I tried to find what this really meant. And I found many different, not necessarily conflicting, but many different versions of what Miri and Piri really mean. And one of the words that kept coming up was this word sovereignty. And now I've, you've heard me say in one of the past episodes that we can't entirely trust the internet now. We know this, especially after you know the last few years and all of the mistruths and trying to decipher what is real and what is not, what's true information and what is not. And so what I have brought today is a dictionary that I use um, and it's from 1953, if I'm not mistaken. It's a Webster's Encyclopedic Dictionary because this is pre-internet. So this is um, what I go to when, when, I'm, when I'm challenged, when I'm finding different information online, when I, when I feel like maybe, um, maybe certain words are being diverted 
uh, in order to shape global consciousness, which is likely what's happening with, with many of the narratives that are going on in this world today. So I want to refer to this book, this dictionary, which by the way, the dictionary is my favorite book because I don't know what every word means, and I've learned words from adults who probably hadn't looked them up. So I love reading from the dictionary because it helps me to have clarity and to understand, especially because words are so powerful. They're the tools that we use to create our existence here. And so if we're using a word and we're using it incorrectly, then we could be creating all kinds of nukshan. There could be all kinds of problems happening here that that don't necessarily need to be if we had the same understanding of what words meant. This is a great example is talking about San Safai and warriors for the truth. I had people saying to me after the first few episodes of our Earth Brain that they were almost offended by the word warrior and that it seemed like some of the language was violent when in fact there are almost no other words. However, I would like to say I, I would like to use the word hero to describe six because they will be, they are the heroes of this world because they stand for ekonkar, they stand for this truth of one human family and that is the hero, the person who stands for that truth, no matter what it is that's going on around them, they hold that truth. That's the part of the meaning of Miri and Piri is to slice away all of this illusion that means anything else but the fact that we are one human family. That's the real truth that's going on here. The ultimate reality is that the energy that our source of creation exudes here on this planet is the ultimate reality. There is nothing else here. We see, we see illusion here. We see form when in fact what there is here is energy. And that's what Baba Nanak Dev Ji saw and tried to share with his human brothers and sisters. That's what Jesus of Nazareth also tried to teach was Christ consciousness. That's why they called him Jesus the Christ. He wasn't Jesus Christ. He was the Christ because he, he accessed Christ consciousness. This idea of letting go of form to be able to see the energy that is pulsating through each and every living being here. So back to this word, sovereignty. And like I said, when I was trying to discover the real meaning of Miri and Piri, it was this word sovereignty, it kept coming up. And so when I look here again, it's, I'll read you the first few, few lines here, but it's coming from being supreme in power, possessing supreme dominion, royal, princely. So we can understand that insofar as what Gobind Singh um, initiated with the Khalsa, with Singhs and Kaur, we can understand that, the royalty. That makes sense a little bit. Um, the, to the, you know, efficacious in the highest degree, supreme ruler, the person having the highest power or authority in a state, as in a king or a queen or an emperor. But in fact, when we're talking about one human family, we're talking about a concept that also has a very bad rap, a very bad reputation, this word anarchy. But anarchy actually means without monarchy. A meaning without, and the archy, which is the hierarchy. So anarchy, although it's used to frighten people, this word is used to describe the word chaos, but in fact, what it truly means as a de definition is that we are without that hierarchy. And so this definition of sovereign also is a bit confusing because it's not about, it's not about ruling over anyone. What it means to be a sovereign human being is it means that you are of your own sovereign decisions. You are, you have accessed your morality and you can live from that high, high state of morality. That you do what is best for everyone that's here. That you live from a place of what's right and wrong from a sense of morals. 
and not from a dualistic sense, because we in fact don't know what is right and wrong in the ultimate sense, because we are not omniscient. We don't know what has happened all the way through to make these stories come together. And a good example I use sometimes to explain this, like we, we may think that we're guilty of something, but guilt is in fact a form of arrogance. So we can't know what was supposed to happen. So here's an example. I, let's say I'm in a car accident. I caused, I'm the cause of a car accident. And in that car accident, someone dies. Now, of course, I feel sorrow in my heart for the loss of life. And of course, I'm going to feel some sense of guilt for the fact that I'm the one who caused this loss of life. However, there is an intelligent design that is somehow working here that I can't know because I am not omniscient. I do not know everything. I, ha I do not have the awareness of every living being who's ever lived the way the Supreme Creator does. And it could be that at the funeral of that one person, perhaps six marriages happen. Perhaps six separate couples get together. I can't know. So in that sense, my guilt is actually that, that self-punitive, this punishing of myself really does nothing. This is meant to be joyous here. And we have to acknowledge what we've done, apologize for the things that we can apologize for that we've had some role in. So this is also not just for this example of a car accident, but globally, we have to acknowledge what we've done and take responsibility for it so we can heal it, so we can transform it. Because in fact, we have all the tools here. We have everything we need to live in harmony, to bring all of the information, all of the technology together to stop the murder of the planet. Our human consumption is murdering the planet. What I want to leave you with is what I know is Baba Nanak Dev Ji Maharaja's truth. Through music and words, he shared wisdom. Bani is sung. The words of the gurus are sung in order for it to be joyous. He shared his wisdom fearlessly, which is what it means to be the saint and the soldier. Fearlessly, he shared his words to challenge all of the binary constructs that existed in society. And there are still many binary constructs that exist in our society today. And it's our job as the Sikh family to bring forth this message, Baba Nanak Dev Ji's message, to challenge those binary, binary existences here. Because we are not meant to live in a binary way. He relentlessly, Baba Nanak Dev Ji relentlessly, he went out on pilgrimage and relentlessly opposed gender, religious, racial, and class inequalities. And I want to repeat that. He challenged the inequalities of class, of religion, of race, and of gender. No inequality existed in Baba Nanak Dev Ji Maharaja's eyes. Everyone was created equal because we are all created from the one source of energy, our creator. This was his truth. This is the truth that we are meant to bring forth to unite our brothers and sisters here on our planet. This is my message to you. I'm here to call forth Medici Compariwar, and I'm here to help educate my white brothers and sisters with this truth. Please share this message if you feel its profundity. Share it with whoever you feel could listen to this so that we can come together as one human family finally. I thank you so much for being with me in this time, and I thank you for your precious attention. Thank you for being with me in another episode of Our Earth Brain. Wahiguruji ka kalsa, Wahiguruji ki fate.